What's up, everybody? Welcome back. This is episode 162 of the Omnic Lab. This week, we're talking all things cool down management. My name's Rob, and I'm coming in from a nice midweek episode for you guys from Japan. And joining me in a fresh Atlanta morning, we have Andres Gomez joining me as usual. What's up, dude? Hello, hello. Yeah, it's a very nice morning over here, and I'm ready to talk about strategy. All about strategy today. We're coming back to the roots, boys. Um, I'm really excited about this episode. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about uh, lately, especially because we've been doing our coaching sessions. I think that is something where I've seen the biggest difference between people who are learning the game and learning kind of like the nuances of the game and people who um, are really good at it. This, this really separates the boys from the men right here. And I must say that... I feel like more ever since we started this whole like new thing with the coaching sessions that in the Patreon, we've been learning different types of not just skill rating of our of our player base and our listeners, but rather like some of the different questions that they've been coming up have really kind of re sparked our passion of, of different topics that maybe we've talked on in the past that really felt like we should be revisiting. And this is definitely one of those things where it's something we talk about so constantly, but we've never really isolated before. And also we're going to be doing kind of a more concerted effort with any of these type of things in the future where we kind of start at the base and give you like, what is this thing? And then going from there, because a lot of times our players are just like, you know, you guys talked about this thing on the show. What, 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 what was that again? <laughs> or what does that mean? And so I think that that's, that's kind of a good a good check and balance for us as uh, as co-hosts and podcasters in in kind of in, in general. Yeah, but basically. Like, yeah, I go was ahead. gonna say Overwatch is one of those games that has been going on for so long, and it's still driving in new players. And some of the players that are driving in, you know, they're still learning some things, like even terminology, right? Like what yeah. what the ladder even is, right? What does mean for competitive gamers? I've been you know, playing for a while, some of these terms just seem so natural, right? And we, we throw them around so loose sometimes. But yeah, we, we've we been noticing that sometimes our audience is all over the place. We have really good people and people that are literally just getting into competitive games for the first time. So let's get through a few announcements and then we'll start talking about our topic at hand. Uh, the first thing and foremost is that the game night is this week. On August the 30th, on Friday night, if you are in the United States, or if you are in a very, very a uh, early AM start time for you folks on the, um, I guess it would be the start time would be super late GMT for those of you in Europe, I think. And then pretty decent early morning for those of you in Asia is when our start time is the next day. Um, but please join. It's going to be great. This is our first ever roll queue game night that was not on the PTR because last <laughs> month we did it on the PTR to test it to see how it went actually worked really well shout out to Tundra and the discord for helping us out kind of working through some of the kinks when I wasn't able to be there the whole time with a move and Andres kind of juggling other hats as well uh, really appreciate your work on that as well as Zadka um, are helping us out too appreciate all of you guys on Patreon but uh, just a reminder that we did talk about coaching but that is at the $2.50 level on our Patreon and we'll talk more about that at the end and a special thanks to those of you in the chat today live. We actually have a good chunk of you guys joining today in the AM, which is always encouraging. Um, good to see uh, Shazir back at it again with 1,000 Bits. Thank you so much for dropping us some bits on our Twitch stream at twitch.tv slash Omniclub. Hey. Yeah, I got some early risers, but he's dropping in the bits early because he has meetings today, so he'll definitely be catching this in the podcast feed. Thanks again, Chaz. <laughs> thanks, Chaz. Um, and speaking of sponsors we also have top score solutions they are in large part um helping us out every week pre present the show and not taking too many hits when we do events and other things um if you're developing businesses apps services 
um, organizations, structures, teams, um, all those things in esports field and communities. Um, please go check them out. Check out their analytics and their education resources and their Discord. Um, if you want to contact them, you can go to their website at ToddScoreSolutions.com or you can find I Need Peeling in our Discord um, and uh, shoot Ben a message and he'll get back to you. Without further ado, let's get into the topic at hand. Andres, what is a cooldown and or a CD in Overwatch? Yeah, let's talk about cooldowns. Like you said, also know what CDs or abilities, if you might call it. Although um, I do like some of the things that you added here as cooldowns that are not necessarily thought of as abilities before. But basically, a cooldown in Overwatch is any form of ability that you have that requires a recharge time, which is basically all of them. Um, <laughs> we're including even your your gun, right? Like your primary fire, yeah. your secondary fire. That sort of counts as a cooldown too, because if you think about it, when you run out of your ammo, you have a downtown time where you can't shoot. And it's important to play around that downtown time and keep that in mind. So e even even your primary fire, we kind of consider it as sort of a, a cooldown that maybe you can manage a little bit more yourself. Um, but yeah, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Just abilities in general, how to manage them, how to use them, when to use them, and what tools you can use at your disposal to sort of inform yourself and guide yourself into knowing that these are the right situations to be using these cooldowns. Before we get into specific abilities or anything like that, I did want to talk about two very important parts of Overwatch, and these are a little bit more theoretical. I'm talking about visual cues and audio cues. Both of these things are essentially what's going to guide you into when you should be using your abilities, um, w what person you should be aiming them at, um, and how to how to like take, get the most advantage out of them. Let's start a little bit with visual cues and visual cues has a lot to do with reading animations being able to see what's in front of you and be a little bit more nuanced than just knowing where people are positioned um i think when you first start the game it can be very overwhelming you know you get thrown into the fight tons of things are happening around you abilities are getting thrown um people are like surrounding you are all over the place and as you start learning the game a little bit more you start noticing certain things, right? The game starts slowing down a little bit and things are not as hectic anymore. You can pay attention to maybe what the Reinhardt is doing, what the enemy Reinhardt is doing, or where the enemy team is positioned. And as you improve in your gameplay, this becomes more apparent. We want to take that to the next level. Um, not only you being aware of what the enemy heroes are and maybe where they're positioned, but what they're currently doing at the moment um and heroes have many stages do you know what i'm talking about over here rob yeah these are definitely like some weird things in this too like you'll find that when you're learning a lot in these early stages like andres is saying you get super distracted by everything because you're like i'm trying to juggle all of these balls or i'm trying to like spin all the plates on the little sticks mm -hmm. and stick them in the ground and like keep all the plates spinning but like the more you play the game the more comfortable you get um the easier these things get and and this is something where we want to kind of reinforce some previous stuff that we've talked about which has included the role queue and mastery in a hero the less heroes you are trying to manage learning at a given time and you're focusing on the, the game kind of narrows way down for you and you can kind of really start honing in on specific things. You're, you're paying attention to what other heroes do more and what your teammates are doing in the lens of the one hero you're trying to play, if that makes sense. Yeah, and the beautiful thing about this game is that Blizzard has actually done a fantastic job into animating basically everything in this game. Everything in this game has a visual animation to represent what is happening. Um, and it takes some time to learn these visual cues. I was teaching my uh, my girlfriend how to play D.Va the other day, and one of the things that she's not used to is not shooting at the deflecting Genji because she hasn't learned that visual cue yet. 
what it um, looks like. Yeah, what it looks like. She was shooting at the Genji, and to me, it's so second nature. The Genji starts right. reflecting, and she starts throwing her micro missiles at, at him. <clears throat> and I immediately, I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna. <laughs> That's kill bad. It. Yeah, you're gonna kill yourself. And she was like, what, 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 why, what is happening? And I was like, well, whenever you notice that Genji kind of like flailing his sword around him and sort of looking like he's deflecting bullets around him, you don't want to be shooting at him because he's going to return all the damage at you. And to be fair, that's one of the cues that most people learn really fast, right? Don't shoot at the deflecting Genji because every time that you do, you will probably die. It takes a couple of tries of you maybe losing your mech or, you know, getting headshotted back by the Genji to be like, ah, mm-hmm. that's that's the cue right there. Whenever I see that, I should not do that. It also It's also paired with an audio cue, so it's relatively easy to tell once you know what you're looking for. But every hero in the game has these sorts of animations that you can play around and you can recognize all the time. Um, not just the deflecting Genji, but every single ability has this sort of nuance that you can play around as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like like Andres is saying, you have to you have to really like something that's really hard for I think players to kind of transition out of the basic side of this. Visual cues still extends to intermediate and and also into advanced aspects because your responsibility is starting to increase more by the speed in which you can recognize these. So, for example, if a Genji is deflecting, is almost too late at some points. If a Widowmaker or a McCree or somebody that's shooting a hit scan project um like ability into the Genji, you have to think like two steps ahead. If this Genji is even approaching you and you haven't seen him for a while, there's a good chance he's trying to bait out your ability to deflect the instant that you shoot. So there's there's this next layer of things of predictability, of baiting, of mind games, and then somewhere in there, you're also trying to interpret all all of the effects going on at the same time, and what you should be doing in response to those things. That's where we're going to start getting into the cooldown management. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> the deflecting Genji, I think, is an obvious example. I think most people kind of get that one pretty fast after they've been playing Overwatch. Um, mm-hmm. But let's let's talk about a, maybe a medium medium skill more like animation recognition um and i'm talking about the orissa pool we're kind of talking about this the other day and i kind of want to dissect it for everyone um the way that you should think about this animation the orissa pool actually consists of three different stages that you should know the first one is a traveling stage when you see it go out this is a great stage for you to kind of like cue yourself up like okay the pool is going make yourself align with the pool, right? If you're a roadhog, maybe see where the pool is going and maybe start positioning yourself in a place where you know you're going to be able to hook towards the pool. Then comes the second stage where the Orisa actually triggers the pool. In this second stage, it's very important to be paying attention to how the animation is looking. If the Orisa orb has any lines or rays coming out of the of the circle it means that it's touching an enemy hero and somebody is going to be pulled if you don't see any of these beams or rays when the orisa triggers it that should be a tell for you that nothing is being Nothing's pulled gonna happen. and you all, you already know this you don't even have to wait and see you by just by looking at the animation you already know this but let's assume that there is there is a ray sticking out of the orisa pool and you know that somebody's <laughs> about to get pulled in this second stage When she pulls the person, the Orisa orb will sort of expand a little bit. There's this this wiggly lines around the orb that when she pulls, they almost expand the orb and it loses a little bit of its roundness and it kind of becomes more like this like wiggly, like wavy ball. Um, And for a second, it like expands and contracts. This is your cue right here. If you're a Roadhog or any hero that wants to throw an ability at this halt, this is when you do it. Right as she pushes the wiggly balls, you aim your hook exactly at the halt. And it usually takes about the same amount of time of your hook to travel and the person getting pulled into the center to for you to land it right there. So you, you don't even have to see the hero first getting pulled. 
only by looking at the animation in, in the pool, you can pull off a lot of combos. And this is kind of the sort of thing we're talking about with animation reading. Um, you, you can make the game so much easier for you if you learn to detect some of these cues. Now, the other thing that you're going to want to do when you're playing the hero in in recognizing visual cues is the difficulty that Andres brought up is not just like an example, a specific one hero thing, but the one thing that a lot of, I guess you could say, higher gold into mid-diamond, even up through Masters players really struggle with is that they don't really pay attention very much to what the team is doing. They pay more attention to what the enemy team is doing. And that's really that's a really big hurdle for a lot of players to overcome. And I think that was my biggest hurdle in sitting in Platinum for so long, especially on my support heroes, is knowing outside of my ultimate, what am I doing with my team? You know, mm -hmm. How am I setting them up for success? How am I monitoring my allies' cooldowns? That's the, kind of the next stage, because eventually you get comfortable enough playing a certain hero that you're playing um you you know kind of innately what you're trying to do and what your game plan is playing that hero and then once you get to that point the next stage is okay what is my game plan with these set of heroes on my team against this set of heroes on the enemy team and that's going to be even easier now that you have okay these are the two tanks these are the two healers these are the two you know dps so it's going to be a little bit easier for you to kind of get to that mastery point where you're starting to start like knowing what paying attention knowing what things to expect yeah, but let's absolutely. get into the, the 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 audio cues. I think is probably a good way to transition this. Let's do it. And just like you were saying, animation cues, like reading them, it's important to be reading them on the enemy team as it is reading them on your team too. Pay attention to what the heroes are doing on your team and make sure you're playing around their animations too. Um, Let's talk about audio cues because audio cues is kind of like the second half of the puzzle, right? In Overwatch, yeah. you have a very limited scope of things that you can actually see. Um, whether you're paying attention to, you know, the main choke point or you're paying attention to the main target you're trying to heal or anything, you, you're just limited in the visual amount of things that you can actually see on your screen, right? Um, you have to choose. That's why some of the best players become really good at positioning themselves and picking an angle where they can visually soak in as much of the battle as they can so they can have all that feedback. But that being said, even for the best players, there's going to be dead angles or places where they just can't visually see anything. And this is where audio cues really come in handy. Um, audio cues is like your daredevil extra tingly senses to help you fight in the battle, right? You can pinpoint thank different God we don't heroes. Have to smell Roadhog. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Thank God. No smell no of vision smell. in Overwatch, folks. There's no smell <laughs> sense in Overwatch. That'll be an, an interesting <laughs> experiment. <laughs> um, but yeah, that being said, with with the audio cues, you can sort of see what is happening on the rest of the battlefield as long as you're good at reacting to these. So with audio cues, we're talking about things like knowing how different ability sounds. Just like with animations, Blizzard has done an amazing job at giving a very particular sound to almost anything in the game. And if you've played this game for a while, these sounds start becoming like part of you almost. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure that I can envision in my head the headshot sound of Overwatch. No problem. I know exactly how that sounds. And I also know exactly how most or all of the abilities basically at this point sound. I know how the the shooting of different heroes sounds, some of the footsteps of different heroes. Footsteps. Uh, I know how the ultimate cues sound, even down from like Senyara loading his alternate fire and firing them. I can probably detect that without even seeing. Like if you play the audio cue with me, I can tell you, oh, that's a Senyara firing secondary fire. So you can get very nuanced with a lot of these things. And you can sort of grasp even more information about what's going on in the battle by listening to all of these. You don't have to see the Ana nade. You just have to listen to the nade exploding to know that that thing hits somewhere, right? Um, it can be one of the best tools to prevent flanks. A lot of players that are still getting used to the game um, will have a Reaper shooting behind them. And even though you don't have a Reaper on your team, they haven't recognized that... <clears throat> that person behind shooting is a reaper 
and it's probably the enemy, and maybe I should turn around and help whoever he's shooting. Maybe he's even shooting me, um, and I should turn around and deal with that. Uh, later on, it's kind of hard to flank because everyone's listening out for you, and the second they hear you kind of come to the side, they know that you're there, and if they're close to you, they might just push you and kill you before you even get a chance to engage. Um, now, you if you're struggling with this sort of thing, I'd say that one of the best advice things that I can give you is even if you don't have another friend to go hang out with to go do this sort of thing, it's fine. You can queue up some bots and just choose one bot and turn off their attack ability. But um, it definitely works better with a friend that can kind of rotate around and switch heroes for you. But basically go into a custom game and stands anywhere where the your friend or the bot can go on high ground and low ground and close your eyes and try to track their movement without with your mouse without looking at your screen and you can use the sound in your head in your headphones to figure out where they're going and this is the point where a lot of players are going to be like what do you mean headphones i'm using my speakers <laughs> and this is the point where we have to say you need to be using headphones if you want to be improving in this aspect this is a gigantic aspect of your gameplay that you may be missing out on that is true in 90 i would even say 100 percent of shooting games that don't involve like turn-based shooting or like randomness and, and firing if that makes sense like oh no absolutely you definitely need to know where people are and, and this comes to you how serious you want to be about Overwatch. If you just want to yeah, know, play true. casually and like enjoy yourself, just shoot a little bit, like play however you want. But if you're serious about impl improving or just competing, headphones are almost a must. If you're playing without headphones, you are missing out on a lot of information and you're making it way harder for yourself to kind of discern what's going on in the middle of the battle. Like sound cues are super, super important for you as a development, as a player, especially if you want to take that gameplay to the next level. Oh yeah. And in the sound cues, the other thing that you can, this is kind of a, a tiny, tiny thing, but when you look at the bottom left-hand corner, every hero, regardless of what who they are, they have a little like trapezoid shaped like square I guess you could say, or it's like angled a little bit and they have the ability and the uh, letter or button that you've assigned to it. If you're on a console too, it's the same UI, but every time an ability is on cooldown, there's a number ticking down from whatever the max number is down to one. And then it will at the very end, instead of hitting zero, there will be a little ding sound as if it's like off cooldown. It's very faint. It's not loud. And there's also a little lightning flash that kind of animates over the ability. Just like when your ultimate's ready, it kind of like pulses and has that blue energy around it and it crackles with lightning. All of your ability cooldowns actually do the same thing, but it's just once when it comes up. And, and, and that's, and, a, that's a visual and an audio cue that comes up so often in Overwatch, but gets overshadowed by a lot of the other sounds in the game. I'm glad you kind of mentioned those because those can really help you, especially when you're in the middle of the battle. And you don't have too much time to like be looking at your cooldowns or how much they have left. Um, listening to those cues can be really good. That little shing, that means that one of your abilities is ready. And if you're decent and kind of tracking already the cooldown of your abilities, you know about how much they last. That can be like the little bit of information that you need to be like, okay, this one is ready. I can use it without even looking. So even in the middle of the fight, like that Genji dash comes off cooldown at the last second and it allows you to kill that person because you heard it come online. So now you know you have it. Um, it happens with Tracer Blinks, for example. You get that visual cue, you know, now you have it. Or with ultimates. Ultimates are one of the most incredible like battle swinging abilities in the game. And if you're in the middle of the fight and you can't really tell who's going to win and you notice that that ultimate comes online, being able to react to that audio cue, that shring and that blue flash in the center bottom of your screen can allow you to know that your ultimate is ready without even looking at anything else. Your eyes are still on the enemy. You're still focusing on dodging bullets, putting in damage. And that audio cue just tells you my ultimate is now an option to maybe finish off this battle or close it out, right? 
Yes. And the next thing about audio cues that we can maybe discuss before I go into any of this other stuff that we have written down that kind of overlaps is when you hear an ability, discerning whether or not that is your teams or the enemies can be a huge swing in one direction or another, depending on if you make the right call. You might make the right call in the moment, but you're like, that grenade wasn't ours. If it, you have an Anna matchup where it's a mirror, both players have an Anna player and they have a grenade thrown. You need to know if that animation was yours or the enemy's because you know auditorily that the grenade landed next to you on your team and you heard the animation or you heard the uh, visual cue. But the visual Sorry, you heard the auditory cue. You didn't see the visual cue. The visual cue will key you in on what happened. Uh, is your team colored purple and has that beep, 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 like alarm system going off? That means <laughs> that you got hit. <laughs> it gives you another cue, an auditory cue and a visual cue that something's problematic and you should run. The other one would be the visual cue before that event happens of seeing the grenade flying through the air because it is a projectile. Any projectile on Overwatch is technically a visual cue. You can see it coming. You can even hear the twang of a of a Hanzo's bowstring go off before the projectile gets to you. Even though it's relatively relatively fast, players will still just hit the duck key and have it miss if they're playing right. That's where the WASD or AD strafing comes in. in yeah, the and and honestly, there's a couple things to these, right? Not only recognizing them, but eventually you do have to build some muscle memory to react to some of these cues. The reason why mm -hmm. they're so important is because you can practice and every time that you see a certain animation, you in your brain, you know, I should do this kind of thing. Um, let me put down an example here so you guys can kind of, let's talk about the Rhine versus Rhine battle because, because that is a cool battle of whoever uses their cooldowns better will have the edge on that um, as a team specifically. When two Rhines are phasing with each other, they're sort of in this standoff where they're holding their shield, the team is sort of behind them, they're providing this backup damage, and they're trying to close the gap on one another without being too risky or exposing themselves much so they can sort of start swinging up on one another. Um, one of the signs of inexperienced Rhines is in this sort of like standoff, they will be a little bit too liberal with the usage of their shockwave. So even though they're standing very close to the other fire Rhine, strike, their fire strike, my bad. Um, even though they're starting relatively close and the enemy team is shooting at them, sometimes they'll drop their shield to fire strike. Um, this has a bunch of visual cues. One of them, the Reinhardt is dropping his shield. That should be right there like a red flag or like a, or a green flag, depending if you're the enemy team. <laughs> so you're going use, for the pin. Yeah, to use some of your abilities. For example, if you are a Saviana and you see the enemy Reinhardt drop his shield and move his hammer backwards, you know what's coming. You know he's doing his fire strike. And more importantly, you know that that shield is not coming back up for a few seconds. That is your cue right there to maybe throw a nade in. Uh, if you're a good Anna, you can throw it right in between both of your the Reinhardt of your team and the enemy Reinhardt and even hit them both. A less savvy Anna might just throw her nade at any point in this battle and it might just land in the shield of the Reinhardt, maybe hitting your Reinhardt, but not really hitting the enemy Reinhardt, right? And now you have another eight seconds where that nade won't be back up the value that it got was very minimal. Maybe the enemy Reinhardt says, oh, well, I'm not going to engage this Reinhardt for the next three seconds while he has the, the healing buff. But then that's about it, right? But if you're able to hit it the second he drops his shield, now your Reinhardt is like, oh boy, now I can get aggressive, right? And now the rest of your team can react to that too. For example, your Zarya. The Zarya maybe was holding out on her shield for Reinhardt because... There just wasn't a clear opportunity to be aggressive. But the second she saw that her Anna hit the grenade on the enemy Reinhardt, oh boy, now there's an opportunity, right? If we get aggressive here, we actually have a very good chance of killing this Reinhardt. Lucio can also react to this and be like, whew, 
That's a sweet nade we just got. Maybe I can speed boost over here. Sorry, I can uh, put the shield on our Reinhardt, protecting him and allowing him to not take any damage. And now we can get aggressive. This can happen for the enemy team too, though. They People can react too. You're, the enemy Zarya saw that his Reinhardt mm -hmm. got naded. Now she can shield and get rid of that buff right there. But it, and this whole situation takes place in about two seconds. Yeah, this takes <laughs> place really, really fast. But I hope that the point that I'm trying to make over here is getting across and is that this chain of events happened because of animation reading, right? It wasn't just a right. willy-nilly, oh, I threw my abilities out there and hope for the best. Everything was chained because of an event that somebody reacted to, right? Um, and it can happen in any time. And this happens in Overwatch all the time. In the middle of the mid-fight where you're just exchanging blows and shooting at each other, you should be looking for these micro opportunities, right? You should be looking for this visual and audio cues and allowing those to help you decide when to use your abilities. Because ultimates are also coming up less often now in Overwatch, this neutral game is kind of the... I guess the catch the catchphrase, as you will, of any time the game is being played when ultimates aren't being used is kind of Overwatch's neutral game now. The neutral game in Overwatch has become way longer because both GOATS, which is a hyper-generating snowball strategy around using ultimates um, and chaining them properly and getting advantage on your opponent, as well as the reduction of like total the totality of healing that you can get because you can only have two healers now. Um as well as a huge balance chat patch, everything's really in flux now, and you have to wait a lot longer. Um, you're going to see the disparity between good and best play, if that makes sense, when when it comes to charging ultimate strategies. And um, the other the other interesting thing is that in this whole discussion, Andres and I were trying our best to try to remove ultimates from the discussion, because in the technicality of the term, their cooldown is not really a thing. Their cooldown is basically earned through good play of your regular cooldowns and your and your damaging abilities and your healing. So that's why we're kind of removing them from the equation. But your cooldowns can be more, if not just as important as an ultimate ability in how you dictate reacting, setting up, and or synergizing with those abilities too. And so kind of moving through this um let's let's talk about tracking your timing we talked a little bit about this before but knowing your hero and no and checking hero guides we've provided a lot of them but there's a lot of really good hero guide resources out there i played a lot of ana i love playing ana i play with a, a, a guy um jay lee that's super good at ana just to practice learning how he positions and do stuff with him but like your Overwatch put out a video just yesterday that was great about an Ana guide and it helped me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like free advertising, you guys. Like there's there's all kinds <laughs> of constant resources out there that people are making to help you master your hero just a little bit more. Maybe learn one or two new things. But know your combos, know your hero, and then you can start knowing the other heroes and how you should use those abilities against A, against B, against this setup in a macro with this team, against this team, against this specific hero, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Hey, one thing that we didn't mention that I do want to go back to, and it's part of okay. animation reading, and this one ha doesn't have so much to do with abilities themselves, but you can read animations in the game um, all sorts of way. Even from paying attention to the direction of certain heroes, you can actually predict things like your shots. If you, if you become quite good at looking at animations and discerning what they're doing, you can see heroes turn in real time in different directions. Um, and if you see, for example, the soldier maybe turning left, that's a cue for you to know, like, he's probably going to go left kind of thing. And you can lead your shot in that direction. And rather than kind of, like, trying to, like, predict or being like is he gonna go here or is he gonna go that just paying attention to the models themselves and where they're aiming where they're looking at um can tell you a lot about what the player wants to do one of my favorite things and you guys should pay attention to this because you probably do it yourselves i do it myself too even really good players sometimes do it themselves too but when you're trying to land 
a big ability like a one-shot combo or an ultimate, you will notice that people start acting a little bit differently. Um, normally, when people are just in the middle of the mid-fight or just going about their business, they're they're pretty... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're pretty... Um, Reserved? No, they're pretty free in how they use their abilities. They're constantly shooting at mm. you. They're kind of spamming damage out there. They're moving all the time. But the second that they want to land an ability on you, like a Roadhog hook or the Zarya wants to Graviton, it's almost like every other ability disappears for this person. <laughs> and they stop using all of them. They sometimes won't even shoot you. They'll save them. Yeah, sometimes you'll see like the Zarya just beelining to you and she's not shooting at you, and it looks so suspicious. Like, why is this Sarya just? Doing? Why is this Sarya just like coming to me like this? And that's that's when it, it hits you. Like, oh, this Sarya wants to grab me right here. And you can sometimes see like this change in playstyle or attitude in the heroes, where they're like, it's almost like they're tensed up, right? Like you you can almost yeah. feel it, like how they're like they're clenching their butts because they want to land that like <laughs> hook on you, and you can see yeah. how their playstyle changes live. Uh, so pay attention for like that sort of visual cue as well. Um, the Reaper. Mm maybe goes into wraith form and starts like coming towards you and it makes no sense right you're like he should be getting out of this battle he's not winning this oh wait maybe he wants to ult me right here he wants to blossom um so pay attention for that sort of also like, if a hero just behavior. randomly disappears like man where did they go it's a good chance that's a flanking <laughs> mccree gonna high noon your whole team you know <laughs> it does happen but I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really, really good point. Um, when, when you're when you're basically running around with with these type of situations where you're observing, especially when Andres, you're talking about the hero models turning, running, like watching w their movements, like where they're going. Um, if they have any habits, is also a big one. If the Reinhardt is using their fire strike on cooldown then you can be like, okay, I need to just go on a wiki after this game and figure out that my Reinhardt is throwing, or that Reinhardt is throwing their fire strike on cooldown. And I need to know how often does that thing come off cooldown? Well, the answer is six seconds. <laughs> so every six seconds, if that thing's coming off cooldown, you can count. You say, okay, there's a fire strike. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's going to fire strike again, and I've got an ability waiting for it. <laughs> so whatever that ability is, it doesn't have to be the lens in which I operate in most cases where I'm playing a support. <laughs> and like I'm like, okay, I'm going to Lucio boop him up. We're going to shatter the whole team. We're going to kill them all. Or whatever it is. You're going to sleep dart him. You're going to nade him, whatever. Like Andres said, use the Hey, that's, that's a good example. If you know the Reinhardt will drop his shield every time he has a fire strike, and let's say you're Widowmaker, you could be like aiming at the Zenyatta or the... Anna behind him, right? And the mm -hmm. second you see his shield drop, boom, you shoot at them. Um, yeah, you can be pre-aiming at whatever is behind his shield, and you know he's going to drop it eventually, and that's where you take your shot, right? You're waiting for that visual cue. Uh, you'd maybe know that it's coming, and you just you just do it. And, like, this is happening all the time in the fight, and the people who are able to take advantage of these visual cues are, <clears throat> are usually the people who are getting in their abilities in right like those abilities are getting a ton of value well if you're just using your abilities kind of like willy-nilly without <clears throat> much thought into them sure you could maybe land one and that might do a lot for your team or it might just not do anything um like i've seen people who are learning anna for example they love throwing their sleep dart out there especially if they see the enemy team kind of like cluster up together sometimes they just throw their sleep dart like oh i them. can hit it yeah, they're all standing there. I can just hit it. And even though you hit the sleep dart, it just doesn't do much for your team, right? Maybe you sleep the Roadhog. Maybe you sleep the Ana behind. But the enemy team is still all in position. They're kind of defending one another. You, you can't set up a kill right there. The person maybe gets taken out of the fight for like five seconds. But it wasn't even mm -hmm. like a significant five seconds because the fight maybe hadn't even broken loose at that point, right? Maybe they're just kind of like poking at each other. So that sleep dart just had barely any impact, right? Um, but maybe if they had waited five seconds, 
then the Roadhog maybe starts ulting, and now that makes sense, right? Now can you land the Sleep Dart on him and cancel that ultimate? Or maybe the Moira that uses Coalescence, can you let land the Sleep Dart on her now that she's using mm-hmm. her ability? That would be a very clutch Sleep Dart. That would be a Sleep Dart that gets a lot of value for your team. <clears throat> and this is most obvious with knowing combos that your heroes possess. If you have a specific thing that you can do as a hero that can max damage, that can get you from A to B and then get a kill and get out, um, if you can do something specific that keeps you safe, and while you're doing that, you can be staying safe and issuing a lot of damage before you have to bail out, like, for example, Zarya, that's really, really important. And this is the best illustrated when you're playing a hero like Doomfist. Doomfist's entire abilities skill set in the game is rotating around what his cooldowns are in the moment and if he has his ultimate in what lens you need to be thinking about. If you have your rocket punch, are you going to use that to get in and then use the other abilities to punch and kick and kill somebody over the course of the next three to four seconds and then save your punch to get out? So that's one way to to approach it. Another way is seismic slamming, using your punch to get in and then um, uppercutting to get out or uppercutting to get in size exam get out there's all kinds of different options but you have to have your cooldowns and you have to know how long it's going to take before you get that one back (laughs) because doomfist is not even about having three abilities it's about having those three abilities and then having one up when you're done with the other three (laughs) you know what i mean like which which one's coming back and i need it now because i'm gonna die and i'm I'm glad that you brought up doomfist because doomfist is not only a hero that is very demanding on you having a good internal sense for your cooldowns and managing them at the right times but he is super dependent, too, on you actually tracking what some of the other heroes yep. are doing. Um, if you've tried to play Doomfist before and you're not the best Doomfist in the world, I'm sure that you have noticed that sometimes you dive with Doomfist and you immediately get killed. You just insta-die. Everything falls on you. People just throw their abilities on you and you immediately die. Better Doomfist, though, rarely die and is, in fact, really hard to kill them and every time they land on your Ana, they seem to get a seamless kill on her or your Zenyatta. Um, and, and for some reason, they're just super hard to stop. And one of the biggest factors of why they make themselves so hard to kill is because they're actually engaging when it's advantageous for them. They're paying attention to when the Ana uses her that's sleep right. dart or when the Ana uses her nade. And that's when they engage, right? They'll be hanging out maybe up in the rafters, paying a little bit of attention to the battle. And then they're using their visual and audio cues to know when it's a good time to engage. Once that Anna has used her sleep dart, there's not much she can do to stop you, right? At that point, Mm -hmm. if you can land her abilities, she's pretty much dead. And the biggest counter to you, it's gone, right? If she sleep starts you, it's so easy to kill you. But if she doesn't have that, then... It's a little bit different story right there. Um, and it happens with many other heroes, right? You can be paying attention to whether the Zarya use her bubble. If the Zarya is actually getting in your way a lot as Doomfist, and she's actually saving a lot of your victims from you know your uppercuts and combos, just wait until she uses her shield and then engage afterwards. Um, play the poke battle. You can even do soft engages, right? Where... You try to bait them into using some of these abilities. So you, so you pretend like you're about to dive them or you don't do like a full commit. Maybe you know that this is going to be a dangerous engage. So maybe you do a punch that sort of seems like you're going towards them, but you kind of fake them out at the very end. Or maybe you disengage a little bit earlier than you normally would because you're not necessarily going for the kill. You're going... For the the for you making them waste their cooldowns, right? So that on your next mm-hmm. engage, no. you'll be good to go. Normally, a lot of your cooldowns are a lot faster than most of other people's cooldowns, especially shields and and big things like sleep dart. Um, so you yep. can actually do that as Doomfist. He's one of very, a very complex hero in terms of cooldowns all over the place. Hmm. Um. The other thing too about learning the cooldowns and mastering them. That is one of the biggest things outside of just learning what they are and what they look like and what they sound like and where they are is just building good habits, which means like a a good example that I heard one time was when every time you hit the reload key, you should hit tab. 
maybe maybe not every time, but like it's a good habit to get into. And then maybe some, maybe you can start learning the exceptions. Every time you reload your gun, you hit the tab key. You can check what the percentages of all of your teammates are. You can kind of get a good scope of where they're at. Maybe you can start predicting the enemy teams based off of yours, and then you can move forward. Um, you can even also take a quick glance down at your cooldowns when you hit the reload button. Do you have both of them ready to go for the fight? Um, that's that's another good thing. Um, the other thing is asking yourself questions constantly in in downtime, not just talking with your team, but like ask yourself, what do I want to do with this roster that I have in team select? Look at and looking at tab. What team do I have? What team do they have? What am I going to do? Am I planning ahead? Am I ready to do a what we call a set play or a planned combination of abilities? Who am I going to synergize with this in the next fight? And 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 it's it's does it doesn't have to be complex. It can literally be when you go in, I'm going to blah blah blah, and you tell your team that, and that's what we're going to do. Then everyone on the team knows that that's what you're going to plan, whether or not it's a good or bad idea. Everyone's on the same page and knows what to expect in the next fight, at least in one aspect. And so they can kind of plan around that. Yeah, I, I think that pressing tab every so often in the game and just kind of knowing what you're going up against and what you're working with is very important. If you're a player that never does this, that just never presses tab, never bothers to look what the enemy team is playing or what your team is playing, there's a good chance that you're not doing a lot of what we're talking about in this episode. You're not trying to think ahead of what abilities the enemy team has and what you're going up against and the tools you have to maybe counter or to set up things for your, for your team in that sense. It's very important that you keep in mind what heroes the enemy team is playing and once you see what heroes they're playing, try to visualize in your head like what can they do with those abilities, right? What are going to be their strengths and maybe what's going to be some of their cracks or their weaknesses in between those abilities? Where can I sneak in my abilities compared to those? And what should I be watching out for? Um, if the enemy team is playing like a Ryan Zarya and you have like a Sigma Zarya or something like that, you immediately know that maybe you can't fight maybe to close range, right? The Reinhardt is going to have the upper hand on your Sigma at that range. Maybe you know that as a Zarya, you might want to save your shields just in case the Reinhardt closes the gap on your Sigma, right? And that's when you pull it out so that you can buy him some, some time to pull away. Um, maybe you're playing a Baptiste, right? And you know that the Reinhardt has been trying to close the gap on your Sigma constantly and been charging at him all the time. And he's getting bubbled, so there's not much you guys can do. But every time that he charges at your Sigma, maybe you're paying attention and you are throwing a mortality field right at the wall where he is going in and you save your Sigma and just like that and you win him that battle. Now the Ryan can't really fight there, right? And your Sigma's like, whoa, I didn't die? Thanks, Baptiste. This is a great example in that case because like you could literally just save whoever you want whenever you want if you have that cooldown. So yeah, that cooldown pretty beneficial. That cooldown is so powerful for you reading animations or reading what is happening at the time. Um, like let's say the enemy team uh, Sigma ults on your team. You just throw it right below where he's ulting, and you can literally save everyone that falls down. Uh, it's it's so powerful to reacting to certain things or certain moments when the enemy team comes crashing against you and you throw it down at that exact moment you create so much space for your team and you neglect so many abilities. But if you do it just a little bit before or a little bit after, it just doesn't have that same effect, right? Yeah. There's This is kind of a side note for you guys. Uh, I was just thinking about this, but it, it kind of fits in this weird category where it's not quite a cooldown and it's not quite an ability, but it is like really important and doesn't really have a whole lot of like time in between. But I feel like people that are kind of in the platinum diamond area are starting to figure this out. But everywhere south, it's just completely gone. Is that people don't understand that there is a melee button in this game. For whatever reason, melee buttons don't have any any use or existence or, or function in an FPS game like Overwatch for these type of players. Because like I'll talk with anyone in the game and I'll be like... 
I just watched 30 minutes of a coaching session with, with one of my, my coach, like coaches, I guess you could say, or students, however you want to take that. And they, they didn't hit the melee button a single time in like three games. I was like, well, <laughs> we, we have a very clear issue here that we're losing 30 damage in a quick melee. Anytime someone comes close to you and you can finish them off or work that into your rotation when you're out of ammo, it's, it's free damage if they're, da- if they're that close and they want to contest you. Yeah, that's one of those abilities that you have to kind of build some muscle memory to use. To be fair, the key, the, the hotkey where it normally is, uh, V, it's to me v. Is, is one of the worst hotkeys that you can have melee on. Um, it's one of the first things that I change. I usually put it on my mouse because V in a fast-paced shooter like Overwatch actually takes a lot of your movement hand out of the way and you can't move as freely when you're trying to v people uh into meling once you can free that up or maybe find a better key or honestly i think that putting on your mouse is usually one of the best things that you can do so you can react quickly usually the times where you have to melee come very fast and they go away very fast um so you gotta be able to react to that in the moment without wasting too much time Uh, but it can be great in a couple different times when you run out of bullets and you just have to finish someone off, melee is great. Um, when you're close to a shield and they're trying to dance you around the shield, you can actually you can punch them. You can actually like guaranteed thirty damage uh, with that. And maybe alternating your fire with meleeing in those positions is a good idea. It can also help you put in damage in between some of your shots, so you can conserve some ammo and use it in places where it's a little bit easier to get those shots in, right? Like, so again, while you're dancing around the shield or while you're going around corners, um, when you have some heroes have it as part of the combo, Genji and Ana, for example, both of them have a combo that involves using the melee. Yeah. When you're fighting really squishy and hard to hit heroes, like, uh, mini diva Diva. or tracer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They like dancing really close to you. Um, and you can actually sneak in, quite a a hefty amount of damage on them just using melee hits because those are so much easier to hit at that range. They actually have such a lenient range um, and positioning. It's really funny because you can even start the melee hit not looking at them. And as long as you're looking at them by the time the, the melee animation ends, you will still hit them. So you can even like, if the tracer blinks behind you, you can even melee while looking in the opposite direction. And as long as you turn 180 degrees before your animation finishes, you will hit that tracer. That's how lenient melee is in some of these situations. Melee is one of the biggest abilities that good Lucio players like abuse like to an, a big extent. Like They're doing these boop, followed by speed, followed by four quadra shots on a melee to like finish people off. Like they, Their damage output can be outrageous with melees and weaved in. And 30 damage is nothing to scoff at, especially if you're fighting yeah. some of the squishier targets. Uh, for Tracer, that is a fifth of her health on one melee. Yep, exactly. And I don't know if a lot of players know this, but I'm going to hold up my mouse here on the live stream, but mouse button four and mouse button five are the closest to your wrist and the furthest from your wrist, respectively. Four is close, five is far. And those two buttons, mouse four is actually pre-binded as a secondary key bind for melee automatically on on Overwatch. Oh, really? So you have V and you have mouse button four are automatically bound. It and wasn't if bound for it's me, not, then you should broken. check it. <laughs> yeah, if, if you sh- if it's not, you should check it. Because every time I've plugged in a mouse or been able to play an Overwatch, um, even just on test test cases, I've been able to use that key for a melee. And if you don't like that key, that's fine. Some people like to scroll. You can scroll up for melee, scroll down for reload. You can do whatever you want. I know PvP Twitch scrolls up for ultimate and scrolls down for trap. For example, on on uh, on on Junkrat, I like to. I don't know why I got into this habit. I like to throw pulse bomb by scrolling my mouse wheel down. Don't ask me why. I just started doing that one day and it just <laughs> stuck. Um, when we had what's his name? Um, when we had Roshan spy on for the Zenyatta episode, and I talked to him, he said I recommend everyone use mouse button five or mouse button four to use your alternate fire, and your right click uh, instead becomes throwing out your Discord orb. And I coach somebody this exact thing, and it helps improve a lot of your 
reaction time because you just right left click and you can get a, a quick discord followed by a destruction orb or your primary fire it's really 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 powerful on on pc key bindings i i think so and honestly this is not like you should do this kind of thing it mostly comes sure. down to a matter of preference the main thing that you should keep in mind is you don't want to have to compromise using certain abilities and moving for the most part you want to be able to have those two completely independent. So a lot of my abilities, like for example, my E, I also trigger it with my mouse. I also have my scroll wheel. If I press my scroll wheel, I will use my ultimate on any hero. So all of my abilities that I need to shoot out or react are somewhat in my mouse, my melee, my E, my ultimate. And then the only ability that I don't have in my mouse is usually my shift key, because that one I press with my pinky, and I'm not using my pinky for anything else. Um, exactly. So my my left hand, the left hand where I move, never really has to get off the movement keys at any point. I can always have my fingers on WASD and my thumb on the key, the, the space bar, and my pinky on the shift key, and then everything else that my character needs to do can be triggered with my mouse. And like I said, this is just personal preference, but what do you what do you never want to find yourself is in a situation where your finger needs to do two tasks at the same time. Maybe it needs to trigger your E and you need to move right. Your index finger can't do both of those unless you kind of like find a weird middle ground in between your keys, but then at that point you're just doing some weird things to play the game. There's also like some of these key bindings are like ride or die for some players that are especially like talented on particular heroes. Like there's, a, for example, again, I'll use Ana as, a, as an example, but like there's a lot of players out there that swear that you should rebind your right click zoom to something else, to your sleep dart and your, your left shift ability, for example, to the scope because it increases your API or whatever it is <laughs> um, or actions per or APM, your actions per minute, or it increases your quick scoping. And like some players are like, just do it. It still works. <laughs> like it's fine. So there's, there's lots of cool things that you can do with those things, but don't feel like they're completely restricted. I will say that there is value in giving it a spin and seeing if it works for you. At least um, test it out. Give it some time. You got to give it enough time to give it a take it for a spin. But we're getting a little further from the point here. Yeah. So uh, this let's, point we're kind of blabbering a little bit. But I was going to say there's probably yeah. somebody who's going to tweet at us like, I am top 500 and I still play with the basic <laughs> key bindings. And yes, I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. This is mostly just a matter of preference. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing, too, it looks like here is the... Um, the way to remember how to react well by using your abilities is the bait and wait on specific heroes. Knowing that you don't have to use something can be used to your advantage. Baiting out certain abilities and taking damage can actually show the enemy that they might actually take the bait that you don't have it. You say, look, I'm doing this to show that I'm vulnerable, I'm retreating, I'm running away, but I'm holding... Ta da! I'm holding my rocket punch, or I'm holding my. Um, gosh, I have to use Anna for everything. I'm holding my Lucio Boop. You know, I, I have my ability to get rid of this Genji that wants to kill our whole team with a Blood Dragon Blade. In which, after he uses his dash, if he can't slash somebody with a Boop, he's useless. He has to run around and hopefully catch up to you. Um, so it's really, really nice in those aspects if you can if you can do those things, or you can save a McCree stun for a tracer double blink into your team you're like I'm, I'm holding this ability i'm waiting for her and final tip is if you lack confidence in basically tracking your ult your abilities tracking your cooldowns using the cooldowns or even just as simple as it gets you aren't confident with hitting your abilities in this sense in this specific case use your cds freely just use them and get used to the feeling of how long it takes before you get it back. Practice learning them, practice practice hitting them, and then you can start learning when to use them. But it does take time. I don't know if you've uh, tried this before, but there's this new mode in custom games called Aim Arena. Have you, uh, have you seen it? I have not. <laughs> so I discovered it this week because I was just kind of playing out different modes and i was like aim arena okay. what is this i went into it and i guess they found out that somewhere in havana there's this like huge 
pillar-like like structure. Wall? It's just like a huge space, basically, where okay. they realize it's not accessible in the regular map. You actually don't get to see this in the regular map. You have to go to the oh, so a marina. Like a kill spot. Yeah, it's sort of like one of those like off off location positions sure. that some people can stand in it. Um, so they basically made the map in there, but All it's right. only it's only this huge square basically where everyone okay. gets thrown into. There's no cover whatsoever. It's just like this big empty space, and everyone just Whoa. gets thrown into it and. Y- there's different ones that I've seen. Some of them you can use all the heroes. Some of them is like only Widowmaker mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, oh, geez. But <laughs> after you do this, like chaos ensues. Everyone is just kind of fighting one another and doing crazy things. And you would think like, oh my God, nobody can play the game like that. But in be- in the midst of that chaos, you actually can start using your abilities a lot. You can start spamming them a lot. And it becomes more about just using your abilities constantly and basically just insta-practicing with them in like a very Mm -hmm. hectic environment where a lot of things are coming at you and you have to kind of like slow yourself down and start thinking, okay, how can I make this work? The cool thing about it is if you get a kill, your health gets immediately replenished. So... Oh, you, wow. You okay. Can, you can chain kills and keep yourself alive. It's like a super that. Doomfist passive. Yeah, it's, it's super Doomfist passive. But like I was playing Genji, for example, and if I was able to get a kill, not only my health would reset, but my dash would reset again. So I got oh, to practice gosh. again. That's degenerate. And like you could start like chaining all these like abilities, but then it was up to you using your abilities, you know, landing them and using them yeah. right and being able to pull off your right. combos. And I ended up getting sucked into this game mode for like an hour. By the time I realized <laughs> like an hour had passed, I was like, whoa. You have to stop. It was like it was like a tra- I was like in a trance where like <laughs> I was just like constantly doing like these abilities and experiencing I- tranquility for an hour. Feels yeah. good, man. <laughs> by the by the end of it though, I felt like it was like a pretty good like Overwatch workout. Like my Genji was feeling like mm-hmm. super smooth. I was able to do like 180s on command and like I was landing my shurikens. My, my dashes up. were looking good. Um, I even woke up with like my arm kind of like hurting the next day from I guess like all the ability <laughs> spamming. Just spinning around that, all over. Yeah, that I had been doing Keyboard. like for a whole hour. Um, <laughs> but it could be a cool game mode if you just, if you guys just want to practice like raw aim and using your abilities um is a is a pretty cool mode to go into a little hectic but i think it sort of emulates the pressure that sometimes you have in the middle of the fray in like overwatch you know 1v1s and free-for-all deathmatch i feel like are also up there on things to recommend just to go practice those type of things and uh if you want you can even just make custom games like i did one with uh, a coaching session with a gm player that was learning a new hero and uh it was in that case we were just messing around with Ana and like learning hitboxes for certain uh certain abilities and like how to aim them for the 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 sleep dart and learning that heroes hitboxes are actually pretty triangular in a lot of cases or trapezoidal where they're really heavily weighted towards the bottom and if you don't actually need a headshot and ability you could just hit them in the legs it's really big hitbox it's huge and uh so we just turned off all of the cooldowns and we're like okay i'm going to run around the map and uh, you can sleep dart whenever you want. And we'll just try it out and keep practicing. It's a really good way to do it. Um, and again, I'll just reinforce something that we said earlier. Definitely, if, you're, if you want to learn audio cues, get a buddy, run into a custom game, and close your eyes and try to track them. It's really, really fun and really <laughs> hard the first time you do it if you've not done it before. But it's, it's really helpful. And a, lot of All right. the, a big part of like learning these, just to close it off, is just playing the game. But just be conscious about them when you're playing the game. Know that you should be looking out for these things. Know that other players are looking out for these things. Sometimes you will be surprised, like, whoa, how did that person react so fast to what I was doing? Or, like, how did he get that headshot when I wasn't even showing myself before? And a lot of it comes down to, like, maybe they read you. They read those audio cues. They read that visual cue. Sometimes with Widow, for example, I'll hear a tracer kind of, like you're using her blinks somewhere behind the map and if you have a good good map knowledge you might know exactly where she's coming from and i've pre-aimed in that location 
I aim at like the the head height, and I haven't even seen the tracer, but I heard her, and I know that the more more than likely place she's going to come is maybe this hallway, and I'm pre aiming already. And the second she comes out, boom, headshot on her. And to her, it might look like cheats. Like, how did he even know that I was coming here? How did he react so fast? But in reality, she was giving me like a bad signal that I'm coming this way and I was just prepared for it. Yep. And I think that's a good place to end because <laughs> we're going to have to get out of here so I can go to bed and uh, get ready for the next day. I'm looking forward to playing with all of you in this next game night and also really looking forward to um, getting through all of my placement games and finally knocking those out now that I'm back from an English camp. But let's thank our diamond sponsors over at patreon.com slash Omnic Lab. We have Top Score Solutions, of course, uh, partnered with Refire, Meowsh Meow, Shazir, Shepard, Crimson Fail, Brendan D, Chris to play, Trazic Jack, and new patrons this week, The Nobody, Hito, and... Haley with two A's. Thank you guys so much for your patronage. We hope that those of you who rejoined or joined anew can take advantage of these coaching sessions and hang out with Anderson or I. Please send us a message on Discord, email, or on um, on the Patreon itself in the, that direct message to schedule them. We do ask that you come to Discord to help us out. Even if you are a console player, that will work for you. We can console coach. But we will ask that you provide a VOD or a few VODs, uh, video recordings of your your play so that we can review them. And Andres, would you be so kind to read our iTunes review coming from USA from Kuya Woodby of USA? Absolutely. We had a couple of iTunes reviews. Kuya Woodby says, this podcast is informative, entertaining, and easy to get into. The hosts are well-informed and do their best to create content that caters to all player levels. I listen to way too many podcasts, and this one has managed to keep my attention consistently over several episodes. If you play Overwatch and I'm looking for a podcast that talks about it exclusively, this one is for you. Five out of five stars. Thanks, Kuya. Kuya would be. Thank you so much. <laughs> you've, captured, you've captured the essence of our podcast. It's always good to see your mission statement kind of regurgitated back in an iTunes review, I have to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you so much for the reviews. If you guys want to support the show besides listening, the best way to do it is word of mouth. Spread the show. The second best way to do it for free is also leaving us iTunes reviews because it helps us out. If you want to support the show monetarily, head over to patreon.com slash OmniClab or go to twitch.tv slash OmniClab and hit that sub button or throw us some bits. Those are the best ways to help us out. And uh, without further ado... We would also like to mention that you can join our community. Discord.me slash OmniClab in your browser will get you an automatic generated link to our Discord server where you can join in game nights, you can join in the discussion, and potentially find some more members to queue up with in your given platform. You can also talk to the hosts occasionally if you want to. Want to. You can ping us and we'll get back with you when we can. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for the show this week. 162 is wrapping up. Andres, where can people find you on the interwebs? If you don't find me, you can do so on Twitter at iPlayGames. You spell that I-P-L-A-I games. You can also uh, find me on Twitter and Instagram with the tag not Rob. And I want to do a special shout out at the closing of the show today, if indeed they are actually listening, which I doubt they are. But Ro from the Realm Maintenance Podcast, a very happy special seven year anniversary for his podcast was this last week and he has the voice actor for sylvanas windrunner on his show for a very spicy interview if you want to go check that out highly recommend i had a lot of a good time listening to that from some of my background and playing wow in the past congrats bro on doing seven years it's a big big effort for him that's awome got a chance to meet him at sure. BlizzCon too so anyways, that's going to do it, guys. Remember, don't be a lab rat. Be a scientist. We'll see you next week. And uh, remember, we'll see you. Game night. Thanks to everyone in the chat. You guys were pretty awesome today. Bob Baroni coming in early with all the comments. We still got a duo, dude. Where are we going to do that? Zarya Ryan. I have nothing more to teach you. Zarya Ryan extraordinary. You must learn for yourself. Walk in harmony, my student.
Yeah, Shaz, make sure you schedule it. Month is almost over. Just shoot me a DM, Shaz. I'll get to you, buddy. Bye. Bye, guys.